Christian greetings, everyone, to this week's Truth Provided Broadcast. This is Nicholas from Presence of God Ministry. Thank you once again for tuning in to an hour of Prophetic Facts. The website that carries what I'm about to share and much, much more is www.remnantofgod.org. I pray that what I'm about to share with you will become a blessing to both you and your loved ones, and I also pray that you're going to be able to share it with as many as possible. You know, with all the events uh, happening in today's world, I have been literally inundated with many emails asking, is this the plagues, or what are the plagues? Will, there, will, will we be here for the plagues? Are the plagues real? And so on. My favorite one has to be, how will the Almighty bring about the plagues upon mankind? Will he recreate a special uh, situation or a plant or a virus or life form so as to do his prophetic bidding? Or will he do as he has done all along? Will he use that which he has already created in creation week as he did at the Red Sea? Like in Exodus 14:21, it says, Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. You know, it's, it's not like the... Uh, like the uh, Hollywood movies depicted it at all. I mean, Hollywood has all the glory falling on Moses, who's played by either Charlton Heston or some cartoon character, so that, uh, you know, in Disney, where they slam the um, the staff into the uh, bank of the river, and it just causes it to, to divide. It looks like everything's, you know, done by Moses. Uh, so, you know, the glory of, is, is on the creator of all that is seen and unseen. It was the creator using those things he had already created to do his will. The creator himself caused the wind to blow all night long so the, you know, so the sea would go back, allowing the earth to dry up so that all the people he created could walk through to safety and to the other side. In fact, it has just been discovered recently where they crossed. Looking from above via satellite, one can see a shelf where they crossed. You know, on both sides of the shelf is an immensely deep cavern. This is no doubt where most of the Pharaoh's men ended up that day, as well as Pharaoh. Uh, plus, they have recently surveyed that shelf from underwater and have pictures, actual pictures, I've seen this with my own eyes, of chariot wheels lying on the shelf. You know, not in the deep part, of course, but on the, on the shelf across the top. And by the way, the Bible does say that Pharaoh went down into the waters as well. However, all the movies say otherwise. So, has the Almighty given us ample signs of how he will bring about the plagues upon the wicked? Is there evidence within his creation of his hand getting ready to move? Have the prophesied winds started to blow? Now, keep in mind, folks, the wind blew all night long before the path was ready for them to go into the promised land or wherever they were headed. They, of course, uh, had to deal with 40 years of wandering in the desert because they weren't ready for the promised land right off. Uh, But uh, can our eyes see four winds that the angels are holding back even now? Is our Lord allowing us more ammunition so as to evangelize those stragglers among us? In either event, let's see what's happening or what's been going on. And and by the way, I'm not claiming the plagues have started already. I'm merely reading the signs that prove they are near and at the very doorstep. We see things happening in advance to set up for the plagues. Plague number one. Revelation 16, verses 1 and 2, talks about, uh, well, here, let me read it. It says, And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. Okay? Now, let me read you this little excerpt from an article I found in um, North uh, North Carolina Medical Journal in August of 1998 some doctor by the name of C. Gregory Smith, uh, MP, uh, MD and an MPH, and Stanley I. Music, MD, DTPH, uh, in London, compiled these facts. Uh, they stated that Fisteria pacitica and several other recently discovered one-cell microorganisms called dinoflagates have been linked to flesh ulcers in fish and to fish kills, lesioned fish kills, that's, by the way, in eastern U.S. coastal waters. One to three laboratory workers exposed to posterior pacitica toxins have developed transient adverse neurocognitive effects, including memory disturbances that have a few, if any, residue. There are reports that individuals exposed to eustorine waters in Maryland in late summer and in the fall of 97 prior to and during lesioned fish kills developed symptomatic neurocognitive def- uh, def- deficits, you know, four to eight in this article. Uh, we review studies done to define the risk of uh, Fisteria pacitica toxin exposure and the efforts underway in North Carolina to further address this problem. 
Uh, a number of, now here, listen to this, a number of erroneous reports have attributed rashes and other skin lesions to these microorganisms. Uh, some have been included, have even included pictures of human skin ulcers uh, juxtaposed to fish ulcers. Uh, so if you get close enough to these fish that have these boils, humans will be affected and get these boils. And i got a picture on the website in the Seven Last Plagues page where i got a guy holding the, these two dead fish in his hands, and they got these big boils sticking out of the side of their body. And, of course, he's wearing rubber gloves. Now, do, do a little research on the Internet yourself for something called Red Tide. And see for yourselves all the literally, literally hundreds of thousands of articles about this boil forming parasite that is attacking fish as well as humans that actually turns seawater blood red. I will get into that in uh, the next two plagues. Uh, my last check on Google on uh, September 12th alone brought up 619,000 pages on this topic. And you, uh, you notice how many of those sites generated from, were you know, from our own scientists right here in the States, both young and old. And also notice how baffled they are. In fact, one of the scientists actually claimed that the microbe that's causing these problems is an alien being. You know, sadly, some are going to go to any lakes they can to, per, you know, before accepting the final fact that the Creator said this was going to happen. You know, fact is, the Lord said they would, you know, there would come upon mankind boils as a result of their denial of His love and truth. And as many of us already know, science will try to give us some scientific reason for the boils. In fact, science is trying to explain away all that the Lord is doing, whether it's evolution or these prophesied boils that are soon to be upon the wicked. They can scoff and cough. Now, as we see it coming to fruition, will their scoffing stop it from happening? Well, of course not. They scoffed at Noah when he said it was going to rain. Did that stop the now scientifically proven global flood? By the way, science has also dated the flood to be around the time the Christian Bible speaks of Noah's day. Still, they scoff. You know, the truth of the matter is, even the Lord explained he was using the wind to blow all night to split the Red Sea. And it did split. He said it was going to rain, and it did rain. So science can try to explain away how these plagues are about to happen. It won't stop that which is written. It's still going to happen. All right, plague number two and three, which more or less coincides with plague number one, as to how the Lord's going to bring it about. Revelation 16, verses 3 and 4 says, And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as blood of a dead man. And every living soul died in the sea. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and the fountains of waters, and they became blood. Now, all over the Internet, you see stories and actual pictures of blood-red waters in both the ocean as well as inland waters now. I have um, a few pictures on my Seven Plagues page of a freshwater lake with bloody stains lurking about it, filled with dead fish, with boils all over them. Uh, a photo of the ebb tide coming in off the coast of California as well as the Gulf of Mexico with blood-red water riding on the top of the regular waters. I mean, they can't, science can't hide these facts from the people when it comes near inland to where a bunch of people are, so they'll try to figure out a way to explain it away. Okay, I also have a picture of a water spout shooting out of the ground in Spain. This amazed me when I saw this. This photo was taken on September 6, 2000. And here's an excerpt from the article. I have the, the whole article on the, um, uh, on the site. Uh, September 6, 2000, Spanish water spout gushes nonstop. It says a huge column of red water has been spewing from Spanish soil for almost six weeks, Bla uh, baffling geologists who have no explanation for the phenomenon. The 100-foot-high gusher of red water mixed with soil and carbon dioxide is being shot from the parched soil of La Mancha in central Spain at the rate of 13 gallons a second. The water burst forth on July 25th as olive growers in the city of Grantala, or Grantuala de uh, Calatrava were deepening an existing well. They initially tried unsuccessful, uh, unsuccessfully to stop the flow of water by piling rocks over the opening. <laughs> they have to get a pretty big rock to stop a 100-foot gusher. But... Amazing, isn't it? They were digging a well for water, and suddenly red water comes gushing out of the ground, shooting 100 feet in the air. At the reporting of that article, it had been spouting out of the hole since July 25th, and it was non, you know, not showing any sign of slowing down at all. Nearly straight, six straight weeks since it began, it was still going strong. I never checked back on it, article, as it was all I needed to prove a point to a dear soul at the time. Um, Here's a, something I found rather interesting, and I threw it on the website as well, uh, from a fishing tips kind of a website. Uh, it's got a little article called Red Water. It says, at times during the early hours, the sea is too calm and the water is too clear for certain big fish. This does not mean that very muddy water is better. It is definitely not. When the water is red, you might just as well leave that section. 
the so-called red water is not muddy water. It is caused by millions of micro or minute organisms that strike an area like a plague. Okay, so no, they're, they're giving tips on how to fish and where not to fish. They're already, you know, it's just already common knowledge now with the red water. You know, doing some research later, I found on some of those scientific sites that the average lifespan per infected fish was one hour per pound. In other words, when this parasite shoots out its tendrils, like a little fisherman, it's, you know, it's got these things that shoots out, and attaches to the fish, it reels itself in. It causes the fish to become covered in boils after, you know, after it attaches itself to the fish. These boils seep a toxic fluid that actually turns H2O blood red. You know, if the fish weighs one pound, it's going to be dead in one hour. If it weighs 100 pounds, it's going to be dead in 100 hours, and so on and so forth. So the thing is, they're, they're finding trillions. Well, uh, well, I think it was trillions, an article I saw years ago. Where they just can't count the number of dead fish that are coming up on shore and stuff like that out of the ocean, you know, in the middle of the ocean someplace. I also read an article some time ago. I don't have it on, this, on my page here. Uh, I do have it where it's called, there's a black spot. I think it's in uh, Lake Michigan. In the middle somewhere where you can't see it from land, there's just black water. It's just black, black water. Uh, I don't, I don't know. What the re I never really researched it. I just thought it was pretty weird looking in the picture. Anyway, question: Why do you suppose the Creator is allowing the water to turn to blood, or the appearance of blood? The truth is, man reaps as he sows. The Lord always gives the man what he desires in his heart. The Word of God gives us a blunt answer to that question. In Revelation 16 verse 6, it says. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. Those that thirst after blood shall have all the blood they can ever imagine. If they're bloodthirsty, they're going to get blood to drink. The plagues are merely rebukes on those that persecute the Lord's children all throughout history. That's right. Babylon is the main target here. And who is Babylon? Well, stop by the website. There's a couple of pages on the site that will uh, give you an absolute understanding to that point, like in the Bible truth section or the uh, prophecy section, I have a page called Horror Babylon, plus I have a Horror Babylon flash animation that takes about an hour to watch. Uh, pretty amazing stuff. Anyway, plague number four. Revelation 16, verse 8. It says, And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. Okay? Now, I might... Um, Seven Last Plagues page on the website in the prophecy section. I got pictures of, you know, solar winds and uh, uh, solar tornadoes. I actually have a quick little video. I, I hope it's still on the site. I linked it from another site years ago. There's a, and they knew about this back in 1996. It's a video from 1996 of a tornado on the surface of our sun going 300,000 miles an hour, and it's about the size of our planet. And they were predicting back in 96 that it's going to cause some weird climate changes around the year 2000 to us along with all those strange solar flares that mess up your television stations, those of you that don't use cable or satellite TV. You know what I'm talking about. Anyway, um, but science did what? They decided to call it El Nino. You know, they'll do whatever they can, folks. They'll, they're going to do whatever they can. Uh, for all of those that are within Babylon, the sun-worshipping, Sunday-keeping churches of the world will look upon this one as their, their blessing directly. Okay? This is an open rebuke of biblical proportions upon this so-called Sunday Sabbath. Yet, will they repent? Think about that for a moment. The very sun god they worshipped is now become their tormentor. And it is not dancing in the sky, as Satan uh, made it appear to do back in 1917 over Fatima. The Catholic Church had this so-called apparition of Mary, and she makes the sun dance around in the sky where they could even photograph it. Okay? Funny they would use the sun, right? Anyway, back then it was done before the eyes of those being deceived directly by the by the first mainstream manifestation of Satan himself as Mary, the mother of Jesus. This plague is an open rebuke. This plague of heat, it's an open rebuke on those that do as the sun-worshipping whore of Babylon has taught them the world over this time. Yet again, I ask, will they repent? Well, according to the most accurate prophecies of all time, not likely. Revelation 16.9 says, and men were scorched with great heat, and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues. And they repented not to give him glory. Now do you understand why preaching at this time is useless? Even though the Almighty is making himself so graphically and 100% prophetically realized before the eyes of every man, woman, and child, and they still refuse to repent. 
makes this next passage all the more likely to be understood now, doesn't it? Revelation 22.11 says, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he that is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. When that passage is proclaimed, I'm done preaching. I mean, I'll share if I'm alive in, you know, in the caves or wherever we're at with those that uh, are hiding from you know, the persecution and the death sentence in regards to the mark of the beast. But the uh, but going out to try to get people saved and find Christ as Lord and Savior, it's just not going to happen anymore. That's it. After, when the plague starts, that's it. It's over with. Uh, in other words, those that are lost are going to stay lost after the prophesied plagues begin. So why preach at that time? Another fact is those that are saved are going to stay saved as well. This is the, you know, In fact, the plagues are the last few months of Earth's history. For verification of that, see Revelation 18.8. Anyway, the plagues are the desired judgment of the wicked. It is what they truly want. It is what they truly desire. All their lives, the Lord has tried time and time again to get them to embrace his love and his truth, which, by the way, would have given them peace and happiness in life as well as eternal life. But their sin was what they embraced, and sin can only bless with the misery, turmoil, and death. So again, the Lord simply gives them what they desire. They would literally be miserable in heaven. The plagues are also used to glorify the Lord. How? Well, the true Christian is not affected by them. Psalm 91.10 says, There will, there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. The wicked which have the boils, the bloody water, the searing heat, as well as the rest of the plagues upon them. And the strange thing is, the Christian will be blamed for all their problems when that day comes. They don't realize that, look, the Christians don't have to deal with the heat. They don't have to deal with any of the plagues, but yet they got them all on them, and they still think it's our fault. Yeah, strange, you know, as it may seem. So, in fact, the method by which brings on the plagues is their claiming the Christians are the reasons for all the disasters on earth. They will literally suggest all have to keep holy the Roman invented Sunday Sabbath as a way to prevent further destruction by all the natural disasters on the earth. Almost every Christian on earth will agree, as will all the other religions that, to go, along, that go along with Rome, uh, you know, the Roman mandate of keeping Sunday holy. Problem is, the disasters won't stop at all. Instead, they'll actually escalate. So, of course, they will blame the true Sabbath-keeping Christians for the calamities continuing. The buy and sell prophesied event of Revelation 13, 17 will begin, and still the Sabbath keepers seem blessed and unaffected by the global problems and refuse to go along with the one world church's idea of a Sunday Sabbath to stop the calamities. And so the death decree of Revelation 13:15 is, is uh, enacted to try and get them to comply. And that act causes the plagues to begin. Their own hatred of truth seals their faith. Um, in other words, it's a holy war against the, you know, the devil in Christ. For those of you that think it's impossible for them to run such a scenario upon all mankind, you need to read my February 2005 uh, Truth Provided Newsletter. In it, I have the article from the Presbyterian Church of Scotland proclaiming the tsunami, you know, the December uh, 26, 2005 tsunami, was the end result of people not going to church on Sundays. They literally put that in the papers. In other words, we're in the last moments of time just before the plagues begin. Okay, plague number five. Revelation 16.10 says, And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and, on, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain. Um, let me read you this quick little excerpt from uh, the BBC uh, Dash 2, I guess. It's an online BBC thing. Uh, out of uh, February 3rd, 2000, it says it would, and speaking of... Uh, a meteor, I guess. It says, it would devastate the planet. Climatologists now know that Toba, oh, no, I'm sorry, it's talking about a, uh, a uh, volcano. It says, now they know that Toba blasted so much ash and sulfur dioxide into the stratosphere that it blocked out the sun, causing the Earth's temperature to plummet. Uh, some geneticists now believe that this had a catastrophic effect on human life, possibly reducing the population on Earth to just a few thousand people. Mankind was pushed to the edge of extinction, and it could happen again. Of course, they're talking about something that happened a while ago. Do you, do you recall when the fires in Florida caused the Daytona 500 to be canceled? The smoke literally blotted out the sun. What if the fires were more frequent and more in number? Or perhaps a fair-sized meteor hits the earth, causing thousands of metric tons of earth to be spewed into the atmosphere in powder form. Perhaps the ring of fire 
that so many scientists believe will soon expel massive dumps of volcanic ash will occur. Or worse yet, all three happen simultaneously in different areas of the globe. Now, truth is, they don't even have to happen at the same time. It could, you know, it could be one one month of fire, and next month it could be volcanoes, and, and so on and so forth. You know, I remember as a young Catholic studying the now-realized bogus prophecies of the Roman Catholic Church. They had one in particular that mimicked this plague so as to re- relieve the fear that their religion naturally places inside the hearts of their followers when the talk of the plagues comes about. They stated that soon there will be three days of darkness. Only those with bees, wax, candles, blessed by a Roman Catholic priest in their homes will have light in their homes. You know, biblically, that it's not what is going to occur. You can't find that in the Bible. You see, this plague is also a rebuke on the whore who was supposed to be a bride in, you know, to Christ. True Bible-believing Christians are to be the light of the world, not blasphemous priests, cardinals, bishops, nuns, and popes. Look at this plague and see for yourself the plain truth on this. It is as if the Almighty is stating to the Roman Catholic Church specifically, you set yourselves up in sinful ways as the light of the world instead of Christian ways that would glorify me. I judge you in the darkness you love and openly embrace. And in so doing, I expose you as evil and glorify myself as a God of 100% accuracy and prophecy. The Roman Church, and now all the churches that have joined with her, prefer the darkness over the light just as Jesus said they would in John 3, uh, 3, 9, or 3.19. It says, and this is the condemnation, that light is coming to the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. You know, like, this, like the others, this plague gives them the desire of their hearts. They love darkness, then darkness is theirs. I honestly pray the Catholics, as well as any churches embracing her doctrines, choose to embrace Jesus before it's too late. For it is bad enough standing in open judgment. It's not easy being in pain. Imagine it all being experienced you know, this pain and judgment and whatnot and the fear, all on top of that, you've got total darkness. All You can't see your hand in front of your face. Yet still will they repent. Revelation 16:11, following right afterwards, says, And they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and sores and repented not of their deeds. You know, when the proclamation is made in Revelation 22:11 that I spoke of earlier, that whosoever is unjust is going to stay that way, All that they are going through will become even more horrendous, for it is written in Revelation 14.10, The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture, into the cup of his indignation. These plagues are poured out upon the wicked without the Holy Spirit to hold back the wrath of God. His wrath is no longer mixed with his spirit. The Holy Spirit will step back after the plagues start. All those evil men in the government's All those evil people the world over will no longer be prevented from doing those deeds they so often dreamed of doing upon their fellow man. The world will literally be blanketed in a cover of evil like never before. Now imagine this darkness. Now imagine what the wicked will experience without the Holy Spirit there to protect them and a sure sense deep within that no God will help them either. The only ones receiving the protection now are those few children of God still on the planet that they themselves hate with a passion. And again, the strange thing here is they are the ones being blamed for the reason the world is experiencing the plagues. That's right. Those of us who refuse to go along with the Sunday Sabbath and break the laws of God will not bend or break at this time. And because we refuse to bow to all their evil ways... They openly declare it is our fault these plagues are upon mankind. In fact, they will echo a phrase said so long ago uh, that Jesus heard while standing in the court. They will shout, it is better that these die than the entire human race be wiped out. Remember what they said about Jesus? It is better that this man should die than the whole nation should perish? Remember also, no Holy Spirit is going to be there to stop them. They can easily uh, pass laws that now put a date on our execution. This will indeed be a time of trouble for the true child of God. However, we will not die. I like the way Ellen White put it so long ago. She said in the Great Controversy on page 634, If the blood of Christ's faithful witnesses were shed at this time, it would not, like the blood of the martyrs, be as a seed sown to yield a harvest for God. Our deaths will no longer help others see the light, people. When the plague start, martyrdom is going to stop. No longer will the hearts of those, uh, hearts of the lost, be moved by the death of a peaceful Christian. Now there are angels of the Lord making the weapons of the wicked miraculously fall like dried leaves at their side. They will be baffled at how they are unable to come against us and do us any harm. They truly cannot see the hand of God upon his children because they have not eyes to see. They will try, but their attacks at this time are futile. For it is written, no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. 
and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment shall not thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and the righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. That's Isaiah 54, 17. Jeremiah also says in 30, verse 7, Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Plague number six. This, of course, has to do with the Euphrates River. That A lot of people have a tendency to... Uh, Preachers, I'm saying, uh, and, and teachers and whatnot, like to, uh, put their own swing on it or slant or whatever you want to call it, uh, without uh, using biblical jurisprudence. In other words, like you know, we know what Second Peter 1:20 says about not using our own private opinion when deciphering prophecy, because the Bible defines all the prophetic symbols in itself. So, but anyway, Revelation 16:12 says, and the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And as I said, many preachers the world over have suggested that this passage declares a great drought will cause the great Euphrates River to dry up so as to allow for a massive army to cross it. Is this plausible or even necessary in today's world, if you think about it? Do we really need to have that river dried up to prepare for the armies to cross it? The Euphrates River... Uh, is 2,235 miles long, give or take an inch. It flows through Turkey, Syria, and Iraq. It irrigates large agricultural uh, areas, especially in Iraq. For that river to dry up, that would have to be some kind of a global disaster, to say the least, for a river of that magnitude. Far worse than any disaster outside the flood of Noah itself would have to cause something like that to happen, a drought that long. Still... Is it necessary for the river to dry up? I would think it would be a far greater task for the armies coming from the east to have to deal with the Himalayan mountains or even the deserts of Iran. The river would be an easy task compared to those. If they were going to cross the river where it flows through Syria, it, it would be the be of course, that would be the best place to cross, seeing how it narrows down to just under a mile in width in that area. Uh, in fact, ancient armies crossed it um, using boats and uh, pontoon bridges back then. Better yet, on D-Day, June 6, 1944, the Allies successfully crossed the English Channel, get this, where it was 100 miles wide, and in stormy weather to boot. So no, the preachers that declare a major drought is needed so as to allow for large armies from the east are most assuredly wrong. The word dried up, or just dried, is translated in the Strong's Concordance to come out number 3583 as ripened or ripe or to be ripe, as well as dry up or dry, you know, whatever. So, so how does this make sense when using a natural translation of the waters, the word waters? It doesn't. I mean, because how do you ripen water? However, when you discover what the word waters mean in prophecy, well, then it does make more sense. You know, we can't use our own opinion. We just can't. The Bible says we can't. In Daniel's day, you know, the great river Euphrates was the main source of Babylon's trade and communication, as well as their life-giving water for drinking and irrigation of their crops. When this river was deep and flowing full, it, was, it also attributed to the defense of that great city. In other words, the great Euphrates was something Babylon needed and could not do without for its survival back then. Now, prophetically speaking, Babylon again relies on this water. However, now it needs it in the prophetic sense of the word. In Revelation 17:15, where the great Babylon is likened unto that whore in, in Rome, it states plainly that the waters which thou, the angel in, here in, in Revelation 17 tells John what it means. The angel says, The waters which thou sawest where the whore sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. So the river Euphrates in prophecy is actually a symbol of, of the world's population organized under human governments. Isaiah also confirms Revelation's prophetic definition of peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues when it states in Isaiah 8, 7. Now, therefore, behold, the Lord bringeth upon them the waters of the river strong and many, even the king of Assyria, and all his glory, and he shall come up over all his channels and go over all his banks. So Isaiah says the king of Assyria will come upon them as waters do, many waters do, does he not? Even Matthew Henry translates that passage by stating in Matthew Henry's uh, translation of Isaiah 8, 7, he says, A gentle brook is an apt emblem of a mild government, so an overflowing torrent represents a conqueror and a tyrant. Christ said in Matthew 13, 
when relating to the wheat and the tares, that they should grow together until harvest, did he not? The only time one should harvest is when the fruit is ripe. Right? The fruit that is healthy and plump is good for the owner of the field, but the weeds that resemble the wheat are shrunken and useless and good only for burning. You know, I didn't realize that. I always thought the weeds, you know, the wheat and the tare parable kind of confused me because I thought, well, how can they not tell the difference between the weeds and the, and, and the wheat? Well, one day I was walking around in Indiana, and I saw some wheat growing on the side of the path, and a friend told me, that's not wheat, that's tares. I says, you mean to tell me that tares look exactly like wheat? He says, yeah, the only difference is at the end of the year, the wheat is plump and filled with grain, and the tares is just scrawny like you see it right there. Plus, inside tares has a little tiny black dot seeds, you know, like the size of a period on the page, that have something to do with a sleeping sickness. You take them and it makes you sleep. <laughs> Everything intertwines with this Lord's truth. It's just amazing how it's, you know. Anyway, so in reality, the hearts of the wicked have become constricted, like, like dried up wineskins, for example. Even the fig tree was dried up when it stood useless. And we understand the fig tree in scriptures in prophecy means Israel. When it, it, it stood useless before the Lord himself without fruit in Matthew chapter 21. So he rebuked it, and it just dried up, right? This illustrated how Israel appears to the Lord when his grace is removed from them. And when I say Israel, I'm talking about the child of God, Israelite, is what the scriptures say Israel means, not what man says it means. The wicked on this earth, just before Christ's return, will have no grace whatsoever. They will be ready for the harvest, as were the tares in Matthew 13. They will be ripe for the picking. The drying up does indeed prepare the way for the kings of the east, too. For it is written that Christ comes out of the eastern sky at his second coming. And would not him and his father be considered kings? And he will not do so until both. They will not return until both the wheat and the tares are ripe and ready for the harvest. On that day, there will only be two classes of people on the earth, the saved and the lost. Armageddon is a global conflict that will end in, the, in Christ's visible return. Listen to this uh, little excerpt from Review and Herald on May 7, 1901. It's also in Bible Commentary on page 982. It says, two great opposing forces are revealed in the last great, last great battle. On one side stands the creator of heaven and earth. All on his side bear his signet. They are obedient to his commands. On the other side stands the prince of darkness, with those who have chosen apostasy and rebellion. Also from Bible Commentary on page 983, it says, The powers of evil will not yield up the conflict without a struggle, but providence has a part to act in the battle of Armageddon. When the earth is lightened with the glory of the angel of Revelation 18, the religious elements, good and evil, will awake from slumber, and the armies of the living God will take the field. What they seek to do to us actually brings on the last plague that destroys them completely, the seventh plague. Keep in mind that the Holy Spirit is no longer holding back the evil desires and thoughts as well as actions of the wicked. Okay? Now, can you imagine the types of laws that will pass now that the proclamation of Revelation 22.11 is made? And, you know, and it's been declaring whoever's lost is going to remain lost, and whoever's heaven-bound will remain heaven-bound. Think of it. It will openly reflect the fact that the demons whispering so often in the ears of our government officials will now be doing so with absolute total control over them. The Holy Spirit has backed away, allowing the entire unmixed wrath of the Almighty and ever-living Creator God to be played out. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a wrathful God. No Holy Spirit to give them second thoughts or morals to steer them away from their evil intent. No Holy Spirit to prevent them from doing all that prophecy declared must happen. With that in mind, are the nations of the world coming together as a flood against the children of the Lord? Are the many waters, or peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues, finally joining as one? Well, yes, they are. They are right now gathering as one so as to mobilize for the battle of Armageddon. Biblically speaking, it will be a worldwide conflict pitting rebellious man and evil spirits against the Creator and His loyal followers. The outcome will be the eternal deliverance of God's people when the Lamb of God and the one who sits on the throne arrives on the scene as the well-prophesied kings of the East. Check out uh, the book of Esther if you want an inkling uh, as to what will occur that day. I implore you. It actually echoes what we will see very shortly. 
you will also do well to dwell often on the situation that occurred at the Red Sea, when all seemed a total loss. The Almighty split that sea to allow His children to be delivered. What was once a barrier proclaiming certain destruction in the eyes of His children suddenly became not only a way of escape, but also direct judgment perfectly enacted upon those that looked to destroy the true children of the Lord. I mean, one minute you think, that's it, you're dead, you're up against the wall, there's nothing you can do. Then all of a sudden the Lord splits the sea, and not only does he allow you to escape, those that were trying to kill the children of God ran in there behind them, and the water fell on them. So their method of escape also became judgment upon the wicked. So, are the signs evident? Are they coming together against us? Uh, If you want more information on this, I've got quite a few newsletters uh, listed on my Seven Last Plagues page that deal directly with what they're doing. Or you can just go to the Truth Provided Newsletter Archives page and just pick through them yourself. But I kind of got them uh, uh, lined up more or less um, where I uh, where they're on topic. Okay, because there's quite a few newsletters. It's just yeah, they come out once a month at the end of the month. So anyway, question: What actually causes the gathering of the nations for the Battle of Armageddon? Well, Revelation 16. Uh, verses 13, 14, and 16 says, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to battle for the great day of God Almighty. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. Okay, basic Bible prophecy 101. I'm not going to get into a big, long dissertation as to what these mean, because we've discussed these before on the broadcast. If you want these definitions, send me off an email, or just go to the website. They're on there. The dragon, of course, is the devil. The beast is the Roman Catholic Church. The false prophet is the apostate Protestant Church. So, mainly, who's going to cause this to, to, to come to fruition? The pastors, the preachers, the priests, and especially the Pope, in league with Satan, cause this prophecy to be fulfilled. Okay? June 26, 2000, the One World Church, or the threefold union of those three frogs, began. So, we, are already, we already have a One World Church on this planet at this time, and the Pope is elected the leader of it. Now, that means you and me and everyone breathing is living in an awesome time in human history. The Bible declares the Antichrist needs this threefold union to be able to enforce his mark upon the deceived that are being conned into believing this one world church is a good thing. Add to this threefold union a planet without Holy Spirit guidelines placed upon them, especially in the areas of laws and government, and you will see this next prophecy come to light very quickly of the, the seventh plague. I'm, of course, speaking to those of you that are going to be alive during the plagues, whether you're part of the Gideon band or you're just part of the wicked. John 16, 2 says, They shall put you out of the synagogues, yea, the time cometh that whosoever th- killeth you thinketh he doeth God a service. So, no Holy Spirit. And all the people, except the remnant, of course, will be having every imagination of the thoughts of his heart evil continually, like was in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, that just before the flood of Noah. Because Jesus did say that, as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be in 2437 of Matthew. And evil laws are giving them all their evil heart's desires. And where is that prophesied? Well, Revelation 13:15, And it says, And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause, that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Speak in prophecy is legislation. Cause is the enforcement of that legislation. In other words the bills, and then the laws. So, plague number seven, the last one. Revelation 16, verses 17 to 21 says, And the angel, the seventh angel, poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were voices, and thunders, and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were on were upon the earth. So mighty an earthquake, and so great, and the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. All right. 
The wicked are gathered the world over seeking to kill the Lord's people. The time is, I would imagine, minutes before the actual law says, okay, at this date, just like it was in the book of Esther, like I mentioned earlier, as of this date, you have the authority to go ahead and kill those Christians and take whatever they have for your own spoils. So people will be camped out on certain people's front lawns or wherever they're at to take what they have, okay, to kill them. Or, you know, surrounding them in a cave or whatever, wherever you're at, okay? That act alone brings on that final plague. It is a war, people, evil against good. And on this day, the battle lines are clearly drawn. And as he has done so often before, the Lord fights for his people. It looks absolutely hopeless. We're standing there without guns, the, the Christians, without anything to help us, like King David when he was a little kid, little rude youth. All he had was a couple of smooth, stall, you know, smooth stones. This has to be overwhelmingly evident to the people with the guns that their God fights for them, because he will. This is a global conflict that every eye shall see. One rather graphic feature of this final plague would have to be the great hail that falls out of heaven. The scriptures declare these hailstones to be about a talent in weight for each one. Now, you can look it up and you know you try to find all sorts of different translations as to what that actually means or how much that actually weighs, uh, whatever the case may be. If it's 82 and a quarter pounds all the way up to 200 pounds per stone or hail stone, that hail is going to be traveling at, at an astronomical velocity when it hits its target. So it doesn't have to be that heavy at that speed. You know what a small bullet can do if it's traveling at a, at a large velocity. Well, imagine something that weighs anywhere from 82 pounds to 200 pounds coming out of the sky faster than a bullet. And rest assured, who or whatever it hits will not be there afterwards. All of the wicked will die on this day as a direct result of coming against the child of God. He will fight for us. We will not die. Those of us who are alive during the plagues that are true Christians are guaranteed never to die. We will leave the planet as did Elijah. We will ascend. And then the dead in, you know, the dead in Christ will rise first, of course. And then we, which are you know, remaining, will be caught up to meet him in the air. So as prophesied, their weapons are going to fall at their sides, absolutely useless. And they will die in great horror. Hebrews 10.31 plainly says it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. This particular plague is one that is yet to arrive in reality. There is no slippage on this one. There is no pre-creation, um, like pre, no, well, there's no creation of the other ones. It's just what is already here on the planet that the Lord is using. And what I mean is this. And I could share with you tons of websites pointing to a massive increase in meteor, you know, meteor activity. Uh, is that this plague's herald? No. Why not? Because this one will arrive on its own. It will be a massive comet because hail is water, and comets are mostly ice. Uh, that is yet to be that's you know, yet to be discovered, or has it already been sighted? We don't know. Our government leaders could have decided not to panic the people and so not let us know about some massive planet killer coming this way. I mean, look at, look, you know, looking at today's lie-embracing media, along with the Vatican and the White House, spin-doctoring and playing games on a daily basis with the truth, I would not be the least, best, uh, least bit surprised that this planet killer is already on the, you know, on the horizon to some extent. And, and those people that have the ability to see it with their tools are being told to shut up. So who knows? I'm not saying it is out there. I'm just saying who knows? Because, I mean, look at, the, look at the media. They don't tell you anything anyway. They don't tell you the truth. As Bible-believing Christians, we realize that the Almighty prefers that all men are saved. He does not want anyone to die or eventually burn in hellfire. Second Peter 3, 9 tells us that the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Most of you that receive my newsletters understand that the Lord has been blessing us with ample time to get right with him so as to be ready for his arrival. As it was in the days of Noah, we too have many years to prepare. Noah had 120 years to build the ark and to warn the people. So far, we've had over 161 years since the end began. How do we know that? Well, it has to do with the well-documented and historically dated prophecy of Daniel chapter 9. There's no more, da uh, no, there's no more time prophecies, but Daniel had one. You know, when that one ended, that was it. We don't have time prophecy anymore. We, have, we know what's going to happen next. We just don't know when. But Daniel had a bunch of dated prophecies, and they've all been fulfilled on the exact dates. 
This is one prophecy that has blessed us all with the ability to proclaim to those that say history repeats itself with proof that, nope, not prophetic history. That can't possibly happen. It can't repeat itself because the prophecy of Daniel stated certain events that needed to occur in certain years of man's existence. So how do you repeat a date and time? You can't do it. A basic study of eschatology on this particular prophecy makes it aware, rather aware, that the 2003 year prophecy came to its climax or end in 1844. I have a breakdown of this prophecy in my book, The Rapture. Why do I have it in that book? Well, it is from this particular prophecy that the two Catholic Jesuit priests twisted prophetic events to preach a lie called a seven-year trib to the unsuspecting world so as to squelch the great reformation of Luther. They tried to scare the people back into the pews. I share evidence of that fact as well as that book. And yes, online, and yes, this uh, uh, book is free. Uh, last warning, uh, after 161 years, it is still proclaimed. If you are in the Roman Catholic Church, or if you embrace the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church in your church, and right now all mainline Protestant churches do, including the Seventh-day Adventist Church. If you want proof, www.sdaapostasy.org will give you an, enough evidence to support the fact that the Seventh-day Adventist Church has embraced Babylon and has fallen with her. This Bible verse has been written for you, if you don't believe that. Revelation 18.4 says, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. For those of us that are not defiled by these churches, are we worried about these plagues? Well, I can honestly hear a resounding no echoing across the land. And why don't we fear this? Psalm 91 says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in whom I will trust. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilent. He shall cover thee with His feathers, and under His wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, for, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee, to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou shalt dash thy foot against a stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and the adder, the young lion and the dragon, shalt thou trample under feet. Because he hath set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high, because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Is it becoming clearer now why it's called being saved? For those of you that are not saved and would like to you know, find out how to be saved, on my website, in the miscellaneous section of the website, there is a page called What Must I Do to Be Saved? I pray you stop by there at the first chance that you get. And if you have any questions, just drop me off a line at questions at remnantofgod.org, and I'll help you in every way I can. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this broadcast. Please try, uh, try to catch us again next week. If you're unable to catch us uh, next week as it is aired, simply go to www.remnantofgod.org, click the Antique Radios on the main page. You can surf to the archives from there. This is Nicholas from Presence of God's Ministry saying, Until next time, I pray the Lord blesses you and yours with the desire to be the Christian he created you to be. Thank you for listening. And remember, the truth is provided in the Word of God. God bless.